This is a revision video for the third movement of Haydn's Symphony 104. I'm going to give an overview and talk about a few crucial aspects of this movement and then I'm going to go on to play through the whole movement with a score as it goes along and picking out some of the important details so that you can consolidate your knowledge of this movement of the symphony. As is standard in classical symphonies, the third movement is a minuet and trio. A minuet is traditionally a courtly dance. You can see one pictured here. Elegant, graceful, an opportunity for the aristocracy to show their graceful dancing in couples. Now, if you tried to dance that sort of dance, the music that you heard at the beginning, at that tempo, you'll be falling over your skirts before you knew it. And Haydn is at the forefront of a trend towards the end of the 18th century and going into the 19th century for minuets to be faster and more aggressive. Haydn doesn't give a metronome mark, so it's hard to know if he intended for it to be quite as fast as you heard Nicholas Anencourt play it at the beginning of this video. But what's true, whatever speed you play it, is that the way the music is written makes it more aggressive and lends itself to that faster, livelier style of playing. The best way of demonstrating this is to listen to and look at the passage that starts at bar 17 on page 53 of the score. Here you can see Haydn has a profusion of offbeat accents, those sports sandos, and the music in general is written quite aggressively, both rhythmically and in terms of the dynamic markings. And at the end of the page is the feature that probably would upset the dancers the most, that we have a hemiola, which at this speed really does go against the elegant three time of the bar, because rather than having the natural grouping of three in a bar, one, two, three, one, two, ba -da -dum -bum, ba -dum -bum. he takes the opening and puts it in a group of two, which cuts across that triple time meter. So we get ba -da -dum, ba -da -dum, ba -da -dum, towards the end of the page. So Haydn really is writing a much more rhythmically uh, robust sort of music than traditionally a minuet would have featured. And you can hear that even in this somewhat slower recording by Andrew Davis. The overall structure of the movement is the traditional one of a ternary form. So you have the minuet forming the A section and then a contrasting trio and then the minuet comes back as an exact da capo at the end. Also traditionally, each section of that overall ternary form is in rounded binary form. And you can see how I've shown that with the blue and the green. We have an A section, which is repeated, and then a B section, which is also repeated, but which includes a reprise of the A section rounds it off and then followed by a codetta as well. The only slightly unusual feature is that if you look at bar 9 of the score, Haydn, rather than having a repeat mark to repeat the A section, he writes out the repeat of those eight bars, but allowing himself an opportunity to slightly change the dynamics and the instrumentation and the articulation, so we get a slightly gentler quieter repeat of the A section rather than an exact one. The other unusual structural feature is the key relationship between the minuet first section and the trio. So we're in D major at the beginning and rather than going to a closely related key we go to the flat subdominant major, B flat major, which is a little bit further away than you would normally expect. And in fact, Haydn makes that moment a little bit more unexpected by 
spending the first couple of bars fooling us that we might actually be in the rather more expected D minor. If you look at um, bar 53, you can see we just have D, F, D, F. That could easily be part of a D minor opening, but then in the next bar, B flat drops in underneath, and we find out that it's in fact in the rather more unusual key of B flat major. This slightly more distant key relationship also gives Haydn an opportunity to add a feature which is relatively uncommon in this period, which is to write out a link that takes us from the end of the trio, the B section of the overall tone reform, back to the reprise of the minuet. And obviously that's more necessary than it might normally be as we're going from B flat major back to D major. You can see this link on the slide marked in orange at the end of the trio section at bar 95. And it's worth just having a quick look at the harmonies in this section because they're quite interesting. In bar 95, Haydn is on the B flat tonic chord on which the trio ended. But in bar 97, it starts to get a bit more interesting. He begins by turning the F at the top of the B flat major triad, which is in the violin one part and also the first over part, from an F to an F sharp, making an augmented triad. And then he continues this ascent in the top voice of the chord from F sharp in bar 97, making that B flat augmented triad to still keeping the B flat and the D below, a G in bar 98, making a G minor chord in first inversion. And then in the next bar, in bar 99, he changes the G to a G sharp, making an augmented sixth interval between the B flat and the G sharp, and therefore an augmented sixth chord, a German one in fact, because of that F natural in it, that resolves to where Haydn needs to get to, which is the dominant of D major. So the B flat goes down to the A, and the G sharp goes up to the A. So we go. So the whole process is driven by the rise chromatically from that F, from F in bar 95 to F sharp to G, to G sharp, making the augmented sixth, and then finally onto the A major chord. And then when he sits on that A major chord, which is a pedal, he then has um, alternation between five, seven, and also he has some G sharp diminished seventh chords like this. So he's got very quickly from a B flat tonic to a D major tonic, which would otherwise be rather a long way. two movements in which silence has already played quite an important part. It would be surprising if there wasn't a few bars rest playing an important role in this movement. And indeed there is. And that's the final thing I want to look at before we listen to the whole movement. The first silence in this movement comes towards the end of the minuet. The B section starts at bar 17, and it being rounded binary, the A section comes back at bar 35, the A dash. At the end of that section, or what feels like it could be the end of that section, on page 56, we have a perfect cadence, 5 to 1, in bars 41 to 42. 
a perfect cadence in D major, in the tonic. You might expect the codetta to begin at that point and things to be wrapped up, but Haydn has something else up his sleeve. Here's that D major cadence up to bar 42. Now it doesn't sound very final because it doesn't end on the root note of the tonic in the melody, it ends on an F sharp in bar 42. But apart from that, it's a relatively normal, perfect cadence. But what Haydn does is he continues that as if it's a sequence. So now we have a perfect cadence in G major in the subdominant. The implication is is that perhaps Haydn is going to go round a circle of fifths or continue the sequence in some way and then find a way back um, from whatever key he's got into or wherever he's got um, to a coda. But at the end of bar 44, he seems to suddenly think better of this plan. We get the upbeat that might continue the pattern at the end of the bar. You can see that in the flute and in the violins and in the oboes. But instead of it being the upbeat to the next trill, which is what we'd expect, that's what happens in bar 41 and bar 43, he cuts it completely off and we're left in complete silence. So let's now listen to the whole page so you can hear the effect of the whole process. So we start off, we have the cadence, it seems to be continuing as a circle of fifths, a modulating one into G major, then cut off after that anacrusis, two bars of complete silence, and then in bar 47, he just bangs down the code we might have been expecting. Lots of fives and ones in D major. In the minuet, he makes this process very obvious. You can hardly miss that anacrusis, that upbeat being cut off brutally by two bars of silence. But in the trio, he actually does a very similar thing. But being Haydn, now he's pointed it out, he makes it much more subtle. Only a listener really alert to the music would notice what happens. So he follows the same pattern. In bar 84, the second system on page 59, we're approaching a similar sort of point. But again, he turns towards the subdominant. So we've started in B flat major, so this time we turn towards E flat major. Last time we were in D major, and it turned unexpectedly towards G major. Again, having turned towards the subdominant, the music is cut off, but it's cut off in a much less brutal way. And then he brings it back in a much more gentle way as well. So if you haven't heard the very um, stark cutting off of the music the first time around in the minuet, you probably would notice that he's basically doing the same thing in this trio. This idea of diverting towards the subdominant, towards the end of the reprise, and then stopping diversion and bringing it back to where we'd expect to be. So he does the same thing again, but in a much more subtle way. We came across something rather similar, in fact, in the palindromic minuet from Haydn Symphony No. 47, where he did the palindrome very unsubtly the first time and very subtly the second time. So just before we listen, here are the motifs that Haydn uses to listen out for in this minuet and trio. He uses the material very economically, as you would expect from Haydn, with a lot of use of this rising arpeggio X material and this uh, Y auxiliary note which happens both descending and ascending. And you'll see um, as you go through the movement that material appears and reappears all the time. The trio uh, is um, has an unrelated X and Y material, although there is a little bit of a relation because the X material is obviously the same except for in a minor version, a minor third, as the first two notes of the minuet X. So instead of D, F sharp, we have D, F natural, but the rhythmically it's very different and the context is quite different, so we don't necessarily hear it as being terribly closely related. But that 
correspondence is there nonetheless. So now I'm going to play the whole movement with the score. I'm not going to play the reprise of the minuet. Once it's got back to the beginning of that after the trio, I'll stop it there. You can follow along on screen. There'll be the main structure and some of the more important features pointed out there. It might also be helpful to have a hard copy of the score to follow as well. Thank you. 